what I'm going to talk to you about is basically the result of five years of work. To, uh, we started this effort uh, in 2010, and uh, this is how far we got. So, of course, it's a work in progress. You see, it's a very nice large group. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Actually, not everybody is on this picture. I'm not on the picture either. But uh, uh, it's about 40 people, dedicated professionals, and uh, they range from the technologists to bioinformaticians and uh, PhDs, MDs, who, who take the entire uh, molecular diagnostic data sets or, or, or uh, sample sets uh, from Columbia and work through it and provide reports, molecular reports, molecular diagnosis. Uh, the next gen sequencing effort is just a small part of this and uh, you have to keep this in mind. So, currently my little forwarder doesn't forward. Uh, so, Columbia now is really looking like a, a, a boom town from the early days. Uh, we are digging for gold. It's not black gold. It's, it's uh, I don't know what color it is, but it's really, really precious. And uh, there are three major groups on campus who are who are involved with that. Institute of Genomic Medicine, uh, David Goldstein is heading that, as you all know. Uh, Systems Biology, Andrea Califano. And finally, Laboratory of uh, Personalized Genomic Medicine, which is headed by Moesh Mansukani, who I will point out to you once he shows up. He's somewhere. Uh, he's going to come. Um, it's actually a very exciting field. and. Uh, you know, like in boom towns, the laws and regulations are not always observed, and maybe they don't even exist. So it's a bit, it's a bit chaotic, and uh, you know, it's a bit uh, everybody for themselves. However, I have to emphasize that there is really good collaboration between these three entities, and we hope that actually it will improve as time goes on, and uh, Columbia will become truly. Uh, uh, power to reckon with in this field due to the combined efforts. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you basically about five uh, main points. I will describe uh, the sequencing menu, what we actually currently do. I'll talk to you a, a bit about our analytical approach, how we get to the results that we uh, return to the patients or the clinicians. I'll show a few clinical examples so you understand what's at stake here and what kind of uh, situations uh, next-gen sequencing can be useful to, to help. Uh, I'm going to mention some ideas about you know, things that we are currently working on to improve uh, our sensitivity and specificity and uh, the ease of returning results to the patient. And I will mention it last, some opportunities for collaborative efforts. I mean, this course was initially designed, if I understand correctly, to, to basically bring people from all corners of the Columbia campus together um, to, to take advantage of this uh, personal, personalized medicine or precision medicine initiative that is the next big initiative of the university. So. Um, I try to make the talk uh, somewhat easily accessible. I don't know if I succeeded, um, but uh, at the end, I think we'll have some time for questions and I can address any lingering doubts or, or issues that you might have. So we, we had some humble beginnings and uh, you know I mentioned drilling for oil, so we were given that kind of hand drill and uh, not much oil came up with that drill. Uh, so we had to kind of upgrade a little bit after quite a bit of work and, uh, and service that we uh, provided to, to the university. And, uh, and so currently this is our hardware that we operate with. We have two MySix, um, which are basically used for relatively small gene panel uh, diagnosis. And we have two high six that can handle genomes in a in a reasonable time, you know, pretty much overnight. 
Of course, this is just the sequencing part. The analytic part adds to it. Uh, so our our turnaround times, if we really get in a hurry uh, for a complex cancer case, uh, probably around two weeks, maybe one week and a half or so. So for constitutional genetics, these are the assays we do. Um, they were set up sort of in, in the order that they are shown here, and that kind of represents the, the complexity of establishing a, a, a clinically approved uh, analytical uh, test. So we started out with the mitochondrial genome, then we extended to about 1,300 genes um, on a single reagent that break down into so-called little, uh, uh, you know, little panels that don't really exist as separate regions, really. We just report out the part of the large panel that uh, the, the clinician is interested in. So that way we can keep our reagents current and we don't have to validate 20 different assays. Um, so for conditions where the diagnosis is really uncertain and, and nobody understands really what's going on with the, with the, with the patient, you know, we, we then go to whole exome sequencing uh, or in some cases whole genome sequencing. So for cancer genetics, we offer uh, sort of a similar uh, set of tests. We offer uh, Illumina TrueSeq based uh, test for targeted specific mutations important for a number of cancers. We have a panel that contains 500 genes uh, that is for uh, stratifying patients for clinical trials. And finally, we have a, a rather complex uh, set of tests that we simplified way, we call it CWES. But really, this uh, test includes uh, whole exome sequencing, on a trio, the parents and the, and the proband, if the parents are available, uh, somatic uh, sequencing of the tumor and comparison of the germline with the somatic data. Uh, both SNPs and copy number variations are, are detected. And we also do transcriptome sequencing, which we use to, uh, to confirm the results we obtain from the genomic sequencing as well as identify translocations and identify over or underexpressed uh, cancer-related genes. So there are ethical considerations that I want to share with you, and I, I, there might be a lecture specifically dedicated to that. I just want to point out that um, it is really became obvious to us that uh, you cannot do next-gen sequencing, you know, just within the lab and. Uh, there is a, there's a whole set of teams built around this that provide the necessary uh, input as far as paperwork goes, dealing with insurance, collecting the different samples from different places, different repositories, you know. So I want to acknowledge these people's work. And, uh, you know, the, the consenting for genetic testing, when it's done uh, on your entire genome, it becomes quite a... Quite an, uh, an involved uh, task. And uh, I just listed here the most important aspects that we have to review. And I think as we go forward, um, you know, we really want to emphasize to the patients that it's important that they contribute or, or agree that we can use their data uh, in the analysis of additional other patients as controls. and that we can use their, uh, their data for various research uh, endeavors. I think that's uh, gonna be a, a great task and we, we have to uh, modify our proceedings to allow the maximum yield of useful biological knowledge coming out from these uh, uh, clinical sequencing efforts. So we have certain quality metrics that I'm kind of showing to you just to illustrate that uh, we take this seriously. Uh, we don't want to report out a result, you know, to the wrong patient. Uh, and, and you have to really try hard to, to avoid this because every laboratory makes mistakes. People submit things, you know, bloods get mislabeled and all this stuff. So, so we developed certain markers that we 
we find are extremely useful to catch these. So I'm using the mouse, I guess it shows up. So for example, we want to make sure that we do a good job in catching or covering all the areas we are interested in covering. So we have, you know, 99% in this case of the targeted area that we are interested in is covered properly, um, at least 150 fold or so um, on average. Um, then we, we display how closely related the patient is to the parent. So basically here, it sh it, this 48 means that the, the proband and the, the mother, which is always C1, share 50%, uh, roughly 50% of their rare uh, variance. So that's clearly, you know, a, a first degree relative. The same thing for the father. And then we also show how closely related the two parents are to each other. So how many of their rare variants do they share? between each other. And this becomes important when you are looking for recessive disorders, you know, uh, especially in populations where marrying relatives is relatively common. Another way we, uh, we want to make sure that we are handling the, the right specimens, we usually display the trio uh, uh, in the context of the thousand genome uh, database for various ethnic groups. So that, that further allows us to verify that the family that we treat as a family in, in, indeed is uh, a family and allows us to take into consideration ethnic, ethnicity specific uh, allele uh, frequencies and so on. So this is for um, those who are not really familiar with uh, you know, the data types that come out of, of next-gen sequencing. The raw data is FASTQ files, which is basically a text file with the, with the sequences and uh, some quality scores associated with it. Not human readable, not human openable even on most computers. Uh, then this data is aligned to a reference, and these are the BAM files, and they, finally the mutations are called based on this alignment, and those files are called VCF. So when you tell, tell us, oh, I would like to see the raw data, you have to specify which kind of raw data you really want to see, you know, uh, because there are various degrees of analytical, uh, uh, various degrees of uh, completion of analysis. So the VCF files basically are text files where you, you, you just state, you know, the position, it's chromosome one, there used to be a G, now it's a C, Okay, and this is the quality of the read, whatever, and how many times you, you've seen this mutation, that sort of data. So we take all these individual data sets and layer them on top of each other so we can, we can filter out things that are coming to a lot of people and are not responsible for disease. So, so the frequency in the general population or in other patient groups is one of our most important filters uh, that we use. So the output of this, of this database is basically categorized into eight groups. And uh, you can read the slide. I'm not going to read the whole slide. What I want to emphasize is that we basically focus our attention for, for uh, human review on two categories out of these eight, category five and category seven. So category five represents rare variants that somebody in the literature proposed that it's pathogenic. We go for these and we look for these specifically. Uh, and category seven is mutations in any disease-associated gene. Uh, category eight is a lower priority at this point, at least because those genes have not been linked to disease. So even if we find some mutation we think are important, it would be hard to prove on an N of one that they are actually causing a problem. So each category is then subdivided into these uh, subcategories, homozygous changes, stop codon frame shift, uh, splice site, de novo mutations, compound heterozygotes, and missense mutations. And we go through these categories depending on, uh, you know, the order depends on what's the inheritance pattern, what is the type of disease the patient has, and so on. So the clinical interpretation, we have three main uh, uh, reports. One is disease-causing mutation identified. 
One is variant of unknown significance, likely pathogenic and negative. And we really report out usually one, maximum two variants per case. We try to be very conservative. We really try to uh, focus on things that the patient actually is suffering from and, and made the patient come to the doctor. We don't want to create additional problems. We, we do report secondary findings only if there is, they are truly life-threatening and if there is truly a, 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 a relatively easy way to prevent the conditions from developing. So as you see, with all this technology, we still have about 70% of these complicated cases that usually come to us after every other test has been done on them. You know, uh, the, about 70% really has no diagnosis. So, so I, I, I really see the, the work of the future is to, to decrease this percentage. And uh, I will get to it, what could be behind this. But uh, we are chipping away at that negative result. Uh, category. Again, I want to come back and uh, the clinician colleagues, uh, geneticists and uh, pediatrician and oncology colleagues who might or might not be here, I want to thank them uh, for their effort. We have uh, sign out conferences, uh, a separate one with the geneticists and a separate one with the oncologists and uh, uh, every week where we discuss the case, we present the findings, everybody chips in based on their expertise. You know, um, everybody's welcome to these meetings. They are open as long as you pass your HIPAA test. You know, you can t take it again. The questions are the same. Second time, you know, you, you're going to do 100% right. So don't get discouraged if you fail initially. Um, I, I encourage people to take that. So as you see, there are, I didn't realize that when I first looked at this picture, but there are the, the knights and there are the little donkeys they hold, or, the, or the, I think it's the pictures of their horses. So, so pretty much any level of training, and, you know, you're welcome to come and contribute. Uh, uh, so I want to show a few, I want to show uh, a few cases where we feel that we really made a difference. Um, these, I'll show two constitutional cases. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, the child was severely ill. Uh, the suspicion was um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Uh, it's hard to pronounce this word, but it's not good to have. Uh, and the kid had two options, either bone marrow transplant or chemotherapy. Um, so uh, we ended up with a third option basically just give supportive care because we found that the kid had uh, Kabuki syndrome, a mutation in MLL2, and this sort of overreaction to a viral infection is associated with Kabuki syndrome. So this was kind of out of blue and saved the kid a lot of trouble. And uh, people were quite happy about it. There was a parallel testing going on in Cincinnati on a subset of, of genes associated with HLH and they didn't find anything, but the report came like a month after we already reported that this is the problem. I think this was like uh, one of those cases that turned around like within 10 days or so. So uh, another nice uh, success, I think, a young girl with AML who didn't tolerate therapy very well ended up with a low uh, thrombocyte count. It wasn't clear why. Uh, the traditional reasons for this uh, condition were tested. They were all negative. And finally, they decided, OK, they, they have to transplant uh, the patient. They found the perfect donor, the, the sister, but then noticed also that the sister also had low thrombocyte count. And uh, we sequenced the family, and we found that uh, the sister and the proband had a Ronex splice site mutation basically puts you 30% lifetime risk for AML. So clearly that was not a good person to get a transplant from. And uh, they looked for another transplant and I guess they followed up the family to prevent them develop the same condition or at least uh, screen them. Um, so the cancer pipeline. Uh, the cancer pipeline I mentioned is, is quite complex. 
It has a, a, a whole exome sequencing of a trio in it. It has the somatic mutation detection, which is basically subtracting uh, mutations only observed in the cancer, uh, f uh, sorry, o observed in the germline from the mutations observed in the cancer. And then uh, the transcriptome analysis. And, and in this case, for the somatic mutations, we focus our attention on three category of genes, known cancer-associated genes, uh, mutations in copina, known pathogenic mutations in cancer genes, uh, mutations in cancer genes, and mutations in genes that can potentially alter uh, the therapy. So basically a, a drug sensitivity sort of uh, approach, although that's somewhat controversial and, and it seems to be that uh, the databases need to improve for that to be really useful. Uh, we find the transcriptome analysis particularly important and, uh, and we try to do that every time we, we can from fresh tissue. And, and again, this is a team effort. Uh, the PIPSIC group uh, led by, by Andrew Kong is uh, you know, in, in very, very close collaboration with us. Pretty much we, we, we feel like we are a single team. Uh, they take care of the consent, uh, the confirmed tissue availability, coordinate with tissue bank and pathology, correct the, collect the normal sample, which is usually blood or buccal swab, and then track samples as they all arrive to, to our lab. And then uh, we, we take care of the billing, bioinformatics, and transmission of the clinical report to EMR, and also, of course, the sequencing and interpretation. Um, but you see, it's a, it's a multi-step process. It, it has many inputs, many different tissues coming from many different places. It's a, it's a logistical nightmare often. But uh, if everything goes well, again, the turnaround time of all these results is about two weeks. Um, so this is how a, a, a cancer exome report looks like. Um, what I want to point out here, maybe of interest, is the tiering of the mutations uh, depending on the level of uh, actionability or, or relatedness to cancer. Uh, we report out the copy number variants from the exome data and uh, uh, the transcriptome sequencing results. So I will show two cases where I thought, again, uh, we made a difference. So this was a, a relapsed AML, um, and we tested it. We found a CKIT mutation that previously had been described in uh, jejunal gastrointestinal stromal tumor, but not in AML, and uh, the patient responded to the therapy that was previously successful in the gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So uh, what you see here is usually we, we look at the, the alignment doesn't work. We look at the alignment um, of the reads from the normal sample, from the blood, and then from the tumor. So it's obvious that. In this case, actually, it was a buccal swab. And, uh, and, and uh, the uh, malignant sample. So here's another situation where, um, you know, the transcriptome can be helpful identifying previously unsuspected uh, translocations or translocations for which, for which there is no fish available and this allows correct diagnosis and, and correct treatment. Sometimes it makes a bigger difference, sometimes it makes less a difference. You know, if you, if you make some two, you know, you have to choose between two horrible diagnoses and then you narrow it down to one, you know, that might not be so helpful. But sometimes there is significant difference in the outcomes. So this was uh, from June. Um, Andrew put together this slide. Basically, he felt that out of the 18 cases we did at that time, you know, uh, almost half of them resulted in data that changed their way of thinking about the patient. So you can see here in red, uh, we identified a traditional novel actionable target. In the yellow cases, three cases, we decided not to act. And I think that's like really important. I mentioned you the Ronex case, the Kabuki case, and another case I didn't talk about where um, we didn't find a mutation that they suspected and that changed their, uh, their treatment. 
and also it specifies uh, the, the blue indicates passive, uh, stratification of the patients for clinical trials. So I think the pediatric tumor experience was an exp especially uh, positive one. Um, we have done another 10, 15 cases since, and the, the ratio or the percentage of cases that uh, were actionable in some way or were important for the clinical management, um, the ratio stayed about the same. So the ongoing work um, that we are currently focusing on is uh, most important uh, on my list and, and uh, if there are people here from data management and, uh, and word, uh, well, I don't know the right words for, for this field of uh, data management, but you know, the, you know trying to data mine or, or text mine for specific terms, collects, co uh, uh, collapse synonyms onto specific terms, and uh, you know, this kind of science, um, it truly um, could contribute tremendously to the precision of molecular diagnosis. The current databases, for example, OMIM, that's probably the most commonly used one, Online Mendelian Inheritance of Men, uh, contains about 120,000 different phenotype terms. So an average clinician, or, or actually our requisition form uh, that describes the phenotypes to describe the patient, contains about 150 terms. So those 120,000 terms are connected to specific genes. Uh, and then the, the big dilemma is how to collapse that 100 terms that the, the, the clinicians usually use when they describe a, a patient with a genetic disorder, how to uh, collapse that on the top of the 120,000 terms, which are often redundant, they say the same thing, there are spelling errors, uh, you know, there are uh, Greek spelling, there's Latin spelling, there's English spelling, there's, you know, spelling in, in languages not even known you know, uh, to us what language they are in. So, so this, this thing really uh, brings up the need to, to interact very tightly with, with the people who manage the university's uh, data sources or, or data depositories and uh, help us to, to deal with this terminological nightmare. Because it's absolutely essential that you match in your filtering of variants or prioritizing variants that you match the patient's phenotype with the phenotype associated with the gene or a specific mutation. And if things are lost in the translation, you are ending up with, with false negatives. So um, that is the reason why the pipeline that I described to you is so careful not to, not to remove any variance from the variance to be considered based on phenotype because the phenotype data is very, uh, very subjective and often unreliable. It's better to kind of do the filtering based on allele frequencies and then based on, uh, you know, the type of mutations that are present and so on, than uh, selecting or removing a, a group of variants just based on the mismatch of the phenotype. I like to do that at the very end. So, of course, the way we deal with this currently is that we spend a lot of human time with highly trained people who are well versed in, in molecular biology and also in medicine to go through a relatively longer list of variants and genes and mutations and phenotypes to try to establish these, these connections, you know, based on what you know about genes and based on what you know about disease and the variability of disease presentation. So the second thing, uh, improve the database functionality. Um, there, are, there are various ways to do that. Generally, we would like to uh, work together with our colleagues, uh, Institute of Genomic Medicine and, and uh, other places, uh, to increase the database, to increase your reference database, because that's kind of the most important. Who, who has this variant and is there any associated phenotype in that person? And does that associated phenotype match the phenotype you see in your patient? So then we, we are uh, involved 
or that's actually my personal interest, um, to develop tools for interpretation of non-protein coding regions of genes. Uh, we do uh, capture the UTRs. We use, a, we use a reagent that allows us to, to have the five prime and three, three prime untranslated regions sequences and the mutations that we find in those uh, available. We do believe that maybe up to a few percent of those 70 percent of cases where no diagnosis is rendered uh, are due to these mutations uh, in these untranslated regions. So the difficulties here and uh, you know we, we are seeking interaction with uh, different laboratories working on RNA folding and, uh, and prediction of RNA structure changes and uh, people involved in um, RNA protein interaction mapping to, to generate a database that describes these, uh, these functionally uh, important regions of the UTRs for us. Because currently that's very, very poorly done. It's very difficult to find these regions. Everybody publishes them in their papers when they identify them, but the coordinates don't match and, and uh, uh, create a usable database is a primary uh, task for us. So uh, the next thing is basically explore these ethical and social uh, frameworks that would allow us to, to apply next-gen sequencing in a preventive way. Uh, so this is a controversial um, topic, but, you know, I want to illustrate what I'm talking about with the following case. We have this five-year-old male, T-cell ALL, um, and the sibling passed away from medulloblastoma. The family comes to Columbia. Uh, there is no known, uh, no knowledge of consanguinity. When we check, we, we find that the two parents share about 6% of their rare uh, variants. So they are, you know, third cousin or so, or fourth cousin, you know, not really that closely related. You wouldn't, you know, it's not like um, they share, you know, a quarter of their genome or so. Because we, we also see such. We, we, the closest was like a half, half brother. Uh, so basically, um, the the child had a sibling who was also the parent. So so that's obviously not a good idea. But um, but even when even when you don't know that you are related to um, to your bride, you know there could be significant uh, number of or percentage of shared variants. So in this case, this couple um, was not tightly related and they could not have predicted what happened to them. Two children with deadly disorder and, and they were probably both, the one died and the other one probably also passed away. Um, so we kind of mapped them to make sure really they are tightly related and, uh, and then showed that uh, what happened that both parents carried a mutation uh, that disrupted mismatch repair. So mismatch repair is basically a process that uh, is absolutely essential to keep your genome from accumulating expansions of, of uh, polynucleotide uh, tracts and also other point mutations. And so both parents carry the same mutation. Clearly it was a founder mutation of sorts. And the child had, what well, you know, these are rare mutations, you know, in the population. It's not high probability you're going to get uh, the same variant from both parents. The kid was homozygous for this. The kid basically had no mismatch repair, neither kid. Well, we don't know for sure for the first one, but we assume that the first kid was also homozygous for this. And so when you have, you know, when one component of mismatch repair complex is disrupted, the entire complex blows up. You know, there is some residual function pot potentially, but generally it just blows up. And, uh, and the results are devastating in this case. You know, the, there's a whole list of horrible malignancies that these people have. 
So this kind of situation could be preventable. And we have a lot of cases like that. I don't, I don't want to bore you with it, but uh, you know, probably 25% of our cases are such where we find homozygous variants uh, that are coming from both parents, the parents not knowing or maybe knowing that they are, they are related. And so, you know, the question is, would that be, would that be uh, what would be the ethical framework for, for offering, uh, you know, clinical evaluation to people who are healthy? They are healthy, they don't feel like they have any problem, they want to get married, they want to have a family, you know, what would be the framework for perform testing on such people to prevent these clearly preventable situations, especially with the technology available today with uh, pre-implantation testing, Dr. Wapner is here. You know, these things don't need to happen and they destroy lives. They, they destroy families and hurt them over generations, you know. Okay, so opportunities for collaborative innovation. So. I, I kind of left this to the end, but it doesn't mean that this is not important. Obviously, uh, people recognize that we are in a totally new era, and, and uh, you know, for me, uh, being able to read people's uh, blueprint, you know, the DNA, is like, a, a, you know, I'm happier than if I were Aristotle or Plato or whatever. They didn't know anything. You know, we, 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 we have such uh, amazing insight into, uh, you know, the nature of biology and uh, what, it, what, it, what really makes us human and, and, and how we operate that, you know, just, just that knowledge is fascinating. But, but we can build on this and we can uh, uh, increase the fun that we have uh, by working together with people uh, other experts. So, so I start off with the doctors dealing with the patients, and uh, you know there are, there's clearly a, an interest from from people who are translationally inclined to have access to to databases where we collect you know our information about all the patients and and if they have an idea about uh, a certain gene causing some disease or a certain mutation causing Another, they can go in and, and search these databases and, and do discoveries. The second group is scientists that are studying specific processes, genes, and pathways. Um, nobody knows the, a specific gene better than the guy who cloned it in those old days. You know, these guys now are usually full professors, you know, and they, uh, time kind of passed by the, the old glory that they cloned the gene because nobody really gives you much credit for cloning a gene anymore. Yeah. No, I, I don't know what you need to do to get really famous. I marry a film star or something. But uh, it's very important that these people who have accumulated 30 years of, of knowledge and insight into, into a gene, its regulation, its interactions, and all this, that these people get involved with us, that they uh, give us a list. Okay, these are the genes that I really care about, that I really know about. If you find a mutation in this gene that you think of interest, you know, co contact me and, and let's work together, find out if we have thought about that variant or we can reproduce that variant in yeast or mouse or, or fly or worm or whatever. So that's, uh, that's the second group. Structural biologists, I can't emphasize enough how important I think this is. I just did a quick review of, you know, the current uh, structure or function prediction softwares uh, on our mis uh, missense mutations. So of all missense mutations, about one-fifth of them are uh, deemed disruptive by the current, you know, one of the most commonly used current software. And I was testing actually in a control who was, uh, you know, uh, everybody would have thought was a, was a pretty decent guy with a decent brain, you know, with a, with a, with a tenured uh, appointment at Columbia. And, uh, you know, it turned out that he had, you know, two, three thousand mutations that were supposedly disruptive of protein function. So you, you can say that, and that's true for everybody, you not just Columbia, Cornell, they have the same problem. <laughs> 
Uh, I, I don't even want to mention Sloan Kettering. <laughs> but uh, so, so we need better prediction pro programs. And I think it's a huge waste that all the variants we find in a lot of people or, or greater than 1% of the population. If I was a structural biologist, this is what I would do. I would come, I would come to myself and <laughs> I would say, I want to know all the variants you find and I want to model them real time, you know, onto uh, all protein structures that are available. And I want to know which are the variants that don't change anything or you see in normal people and I want to see the variants that you see in sick people and what's wrong with them and why, you know, can this change really be the cause? I, I would love to have such a collaborator on campus. I haven't found it yet, uh, but I think the wealth of information, and it's not just for protein, it's for RNA, you know, lipid protein interactions, I mean, totally unexplored. Protein-protein uh, interactions, protein-RNA interactions, interaction between complex components, mapping of interaction surfaces, you know, that are often changed in translocations, you know, associated with cancer and so on. So analytical biochemists. You know, there is this assumption that, that the transcripts, whatever you see as a transcript, is basically what's happening in the cell. So you do a transcript on, you pretty much know what kind of proteins and in what amount are present in the cell. So it's kind of strange, but, and there are papers coming out both directions saying, yeah, this is the case, and then others say, no, this is not the case. But it would be really important to, to, to develop or apply the currently available mass spec technology to, to follow this up. When you see a, a, a fusion protein in a cell, can you get mass spec evidence that that fusion protein is really there? Is it in the same complex that it usually is in? You know, is it localized in the same part of the cell that it usually is in? Um, so I think, I think analytical biochemists are, could, could uh, really uh, join this effort and, and, uh, and learn a lot from our mutant collections. Uh, and I also think that there are a few mass spec people here who are more interested in, in metabolites, you know, identifying certain types of metabolites um, that accumulate in, in, in certain tissues. And I think that's kind of a different approach, but, but that, that kind of uh, analytical uh, capability would be really highly integratable with all our findings in all the variants in enzymes. And, uh, you know, we all remember those big old Beringer charts that, you know, universities used to use to cover up the imperfections on their walls where there was, you know, a hole in the wall. They put the big chart over it and nobody saw it. There are like 10,000 uh, enzymes with 10,000 metabolites and, uh, you know, what's transformed to what. I think it would be time to really reassess how important those pathways are, how commonly they are altered, and, and, and uh, connect the, the effect of the variants on the metabolites displayed on those kind of pathways. The computer scientists, um, again, you know, my kids, I all, I, I encourage them from a young age to play video games. I told them that video games are how life is. Until you get your sh together, you cannot go to the next level. Uh, and so that's a very important lesson to learn. And uh, so I observed them play video games. I kind of stopped because I gave up. But, but um, I see the amazing visual uh, displays that video game producers are now putting into these games that just waste people's time, you know. And, uh, and I wish that there was similar effort ongoing to create same kind of modeling of cell of a complex, of a gene, you know? You could make video games out of this. We could make, we could make exploring uh, variants and their effects into a video game, we could crowdsource this. We, you know, there are some efforts to that point, but, but clearly uh, we need something, you know, like Google Earth, like Google Cell, you know? How many of you use Google Earth? Everybody uses Google Earth, yeah? It's amazing. You can, you can see people on the beach where you want a vacation. You can zoom in that, that, that close. So 
it would be it would remove all this all this uh, all this um, thinking that you need to be a, an MD PhD whatever to be able to to bring together data from protein structure from enzyme function from regulatory regions and all this there is a way to integrate all this information into a easy to understand and easy to navigate sort of uh, a display I think Facebook gene book I, I would love that if there was a gene book there's gene cards but anybody who went through gene cards knows that you know they tell you every product that doesn't even exist how can you purchase it but you know you have to scroll down to the bottom of the of the you know of the whole 30 page to finally find you know what are the interacting partners of the protein you are interested in so that's not the way you know how to how to uh, really advance our ability to analyze genomic data sets so finally business people um, uh, when I sh when I showed this to my chairman he kind of freaked out oh you're not going to talk about business you know I'm like no I don't want to that's your thing but but we, we clearly need better frameworks we, we need better frameworks to allow uh, people who cannot afford this kind of testing to bring them in and have them sequence. And I think there is some really nice efforts and I think uh, the Institute of Genomic Medicine will be crucial for for helping with this aspect of providing patient care. But again, there, there should be, you know, uh, an inherent value of if somebody allows uh, a university to do an exome sequencing. Because with every exome that we sequence, we gain a huge value, uh, uh, you know, basically our database improves. So it, in a way, doing sequencing for people who cannot afford to pay for it, it actually pays for itself because it cuts your analysis time. But, you know, uh, currently we cannot admit that because the reimbursement rates are dismal anyway. So, but, but eventually there must be some way to, uh, to Extend, uh, extend the scope of sequencing on people who cannot afford it. All right, so in a nutshell, I think sequencing is not in itself. It's, it has to be part of a, a coordinated approach from other types of clinical testing. And I think maybe after the next five, 10 years, the, the focus will shift from sequencing to actually a more targeted and more metabolite uh, or protein-based diagnostic uh, armamentarium. But, but to get there, I think we need to do a lot of sequencing. 